Hello, and welcome to Lecture 4 of the Forces Unit in Phys 1104. We've been fairly focused on the directions of forces, but now it's time to turn our attention to the magnitudes of forces. How do we measure them, and how do we calculate them? Well, we know that the vector sum of forces is the time rate of change of momentum. And I've been writing that as a delta p over delta t. But of course, that's an average time rate of change of momentum. And so rather awkwardly, I then have to write that it's the average vector sum of the forces. Well, we know what to do with this. We take the limit as our time interval goes to zero. And now we have an instantaneous rate of change of momentum, which is equal to now the instantaneous vector sum of forces. And as usual, if I don't say average, I mean instantaneous. And so I won't usually say instantaneous instantaneous. That, by definition, is the time derivative of the momentum of the object. And notice that I'm stressing that this is the vector sum of a bunch of forces, all the forces, on one object, and it equals the time rate of change of the momentum of that object. So for some object O being acted upon by forces due to a bunch of different objects, one, two, three, and so on, we can write it in a summation notation like this, which just means that it's some force due to one on O plus a force due to two on O and so on. All those subscripts indicating the target are a little awkward, and since they're all the same subscript, I'm going to drop them temporarily. I'll bring them back later to remind you of them because they're important. So we have this rate of change of momentum is the vector sum of forces on the object. And that momentum, of course, is just an inertia times a velocity. And we're going to work with situations where the inertia is constant, so we can pull it out in front of the derivative. Well, we know what a dv by dt is. That's an acceleration. And this is now the form of this equation that you're probably familiar with. I'll often write it this way. And these two forms of the equation have different advantages. The first one is more convenient for calculations. But the second one emphasizes this cause and effect relationship, that the forces are causing the acceleration. But the size of the acceleration that results is inversely proportional to the inertia of the object. And of course, this is all written in terms of vectors. We can write it in components as well. But don't forget that these are forces acting on one object O and causing that object to accelerate. So these are all forces due to a bunch of different agents, but acting on the target, which is this object. And they add up to the inertia of this object, O, times its acceleration. This equation governs the motion of this object, O, right? As, well, as long as we know the acceleration and the initial velocity and position, we can figure out all the motion subsequently. And so we call this the equation of motion. You probably know it as Newton's second law. Technically, that's not quite correct. The equation we started out with, that the time derivative of the momentum is the vector sum of the forces, is really the thing that's called Newton's second law. This that we have here is a special case for a constant inertia. So I'm going to call it the equation of motion, partly because that's technically more correct, but also because it's just a better description of what this equation does. Quick unit analysis is in order because we need to know about the units of forces. So we have a sum of forces, which certainly has the units of a force, and that equals an inertia times an acceleration. Well, so on this side, we have an inertia in kilograms times an acceleration in meters per second squared. And that is apparently the units of a force. And we define one newton, that is the name of this force, as one kilogram meter per second squared. So you can think of it as the force that will cause a one kilogram object to accelerate at one meter per second squared. So let's start looking at the effects of multiple forces acting on an object. 
Here's a particularly simple example. There's a cart, it's on a table, it's attached to a string, maybe someone is pulling on the other end of the string, but the end result is that there's some force on the cart due to the string. And so the free body diagram would just look like this. This is a low friction cart, so I haven't included any friction force, and so we just have a perpendicular force due to the table, the usual gravity, and that force due to the string. Now, the vector addition of these has to add up to a vector sum of forces pointing to the right, because that is the direction that the acceleration points. And so the vector sum has to look something like this, so that we get a vector sum that points straight to the right. Writing it out, it looks like this, but what you can see looking at the diagram of the vector sum is that the perpendicular force due to the table and the gravitational force due to the Earth must cancel out. And so I'm just going to drop them out. I'm going to allow them to cancel, and now I have a nice simple situation where I have the force due to the string equaling the inertia times the acceleration. So suppose I knew what the inertia of the cart was, and I could easily measure the acceleration, that allows me to determine the strength of this force that the string is exerting on the cart. The case I just showed you is about as simple as things ever get. So now, to check your understanding, have a look at this situation that's just a little bit more complicated. So here is the same cart. It still has the 2 Newton force acting on it to the right, but now there's another force acting to the left and the cart is accelerating to the right at 1 meter per second squared. So find the strength of the force that's exerted by the second string. 